everyone a heartfelt namaste and warm welcome to all of you in this video we would be discussing facts about rahu and ketu rahu and ketu are known to be malefics or so we think rahu and ketu have been entrusted with one very strong responsibility the responsibility of making sure that we dispense of the karmic word cloud that we have taken for this lifetime so this makes them a very very important planet in our charts though they may not have a physical existence they are also known as chaya grahas or shadow planets so let us go ahead and check out how malefic they are Rahu and Ketu, how malefic are they? In this video, I would be covering Samudra Manthan. I would be covering the houses of exaltation and debilitation of Rahu and Ketu, significations of this house, and the remedies associated with Rahu and Ketu. So, before I begin with Samudra Manthan, I'd just like to add in. Uh, small point here that we have always we have been seeing that rahu and ketu are extra active as of now in cancer and capricorn respectively though it is said that in the last few degrees a planet malefic especially loses its maleficence stops working before it advances into the next sign well this is not the case in case of rahu and ketu because they are extra malefic it is a huge topic that will be covered in a later date but just for now this is because rahu is in a pushkar navamsha and also a vargottama zone whereas ketu is in a vargottama pada so both of them would be giving results to the last moment So when we come to the story of Rahu and Ketu, it begins with the Samudra Manthan. The Samudra Manthan is the churning of the cosmic oceans. It was carried on because an hierarchy of order had to be reached between the Devtas and the Dhanavs. That is the good forces, the positive forces, and the evil forces, or rather the negative or the demonic forces. it was also a time when lord vishnu deciding that it is not a period where one could afford to be aggressive asked the devatas to be to create an alliance with the demonic forces or the asuras and churn the oceans such that the amrit or the exilier of life would be extracted from it and it could be given to both the parties such that they could then rain over the skies and the universe now when an uh, uneasy though it may be the alliance was come uh, was had come to fructification what actually had transpired was it was now working as to what would be done what were the required uh, prerequisites to churn the ocean the required prerequisites were then procured uh, it was the mandar parvat that is it is a range of mountains celestial range of mountains and vasuki nag one of the most important nagas who actually resides around the neck of lord shiva and because the cosmic oceans had huge depths hence lord vishnu had to take the avatar of uh, he had to reincarnate as a turtle a tortoise a huge tortoise on whose back this entire thing was situated the cosmic oceans were churned and out of it came so many things but first thing that came out was the halahal the halahal was the poison that came out of the seas and it needed to be it needed to be consumed there was nobody who could consume that except lord shiva he took it he drank it but he did not swallow the entire thing he simply placed it in his thought and this thought became blue as a result therefore he is also called neel kant after the halahal came out many bounty amongst things that came out were people also like the celestial damsels the afsaras they were 
beautiful damsels and they're renowned in all the three worlds for their beauty. They chose the highly skilled Gandharvas as their partners. Then came out the Surabhi cow or the celestial cow and she was given to Rishi Agastya for the upkeep of all the Rishis such that they could do their penance with a lot of comfort. Then came out Uchishrava, the horse, celestial horse, and Iravat, the celestial um, elephant. They were given, along with the Parijath tree, that is a tree that could fulfill all your wishes to the Indra, because he is the king of the Devatas. Amongst other things that came out was the Nirati or someone who is full of all that is antithesis, anti of Sri Lakshmi. Lakshmi was the one that came after Nirati. So the Chanik of the ocean says that anything good would only appear after the bad has been skimmed out of it. And Lakshmi came after Nirati. She was the one who put into practice the first swayamvar or the the practice of choosing her own husband. Lakshmi, when she came out, she was so beautiful. She was beauty personified that everyone wanted to wed her. Lord Brahma, being the creator of all things in this universe, then advised Goddess Lakshmi to set people into two uh, groups and choose from within them. Goddess Lakshmi walked through these two groups However, she found the one she was looking for at the end of the entire drama. She found him, Lord Vishnu garlanded him and then he took her as his own. Next that came up was Varuni. By that time, the Asuras were very agitated. They did not have anything to call their own from the so-called Samudra Mantra. So Lord Vishnu promised them that anything that came out would be theirs. And hence, Varun, Varuni, that is the female form of Varun, and is also called intoxication, followed out of the Samadra Manthan and was given on to the demonic forces. So it is generally said that too much of intoxication in you leads to demonic forces. And we can relate it with the Samudra Manthan. Finally, to follow which was the reason for the Samudra Mantan was the one that all of us were waiting for. That is the exilier of life, the Soma. And as the Soma comes out, everyone rushes to get it. But the Devatas take a breather again because they realized and they remembered that it was the call of Lord Vishnu not to move into any situation where there could be a fight ensuing, where there could be a place where they would have to lose out to the Dhanavas or the demonic forces. The demons, having seen the Dhanvantri coming out with this pot, was extremely uh, agitated, was so happy and had lost within their emotions that they followed Dhanvantri through and before they could uh, you know partake the entire thing or even touch or open the vessels what happened was a very beautiful form of Lord Vishnu comes into being. Lord Vishnu takes the form of Mohini. Let's take a reprieve here and see that the Devtas remembered the words of Lord Vishnu and did not move into any scuffles so they were aptly rewarded for it. When we listen to the inner voice and do not move into a place of agitation, the one lauding us always takes care of us. The Danavs or the demonic forces who have been fighting amongst themselves for so long move up to Mohini, question her about her name because they are absolutely spellbound by her looks, spellbound by her beauty. She then tells them her name and she is walking away when they stop her and request her. These Danavs, these very demonic forces, 
who had been fighting against each other, trying to kill each other just to get their hands on this vessel of exilia, are manners personified and they ask her to help them. She says she definitely would, but she would be the one to govern the entire proceedings and they readily agree to her entire uh, uh, exercise. And when she asks them to form two cues, having done that, she starts giving them the Amrit or the Exilier. But what she does not do is give the same Amrit to the Asuras or the Danavas. She gives them just the Varuni. And Swarbhanu, a very intelligent demon sitting right there in the demonic group, realizes a fallacy that's going on, realizes a mischief that has been created against them and takes the shape, the form of a, a Devata and goes and sits between sun and the moon. If you want to know more on Swarbhanu, you can have a look on my uh, YouTube channel, there is a story on Swarbhanu and that is a story that you can find in the video called Rahu in the first house and you would enjoy the story to the full. As Swarbhanu is sitting between the sun and the moon and consuming his Amrit given to him, sun and moon cry out that he is an imposter and he doesn't seem to be who he is. Lord Vishnu again takes the form of uh, his or uh, comes to his true form and then he cuts off the head of Swarbhanu and Swarbhanu is beheaded. But lo behold, he does not die. Why? Because he's already consumed the uh, Amrit or the Exilier. And as such, what happens is he moves into two different directions. Well, a point to ponder here is that had Lord Vishnu not seen this, had he not understood the play, the one who sustains the universe, had he not understood that it was actually a demonic force sitting between sun and moon to whom he had given the exilier or the Amrit, yes, he must have understood. But there, the workings of the universe are mysterious, though they may be, but they're never random. They're all very synchronized. Swarbhanu, with his penance, had pleased Lord Brahma and he was to become a planet. So, seeing an opportunity in that, Lord Vishnu beheads him and as such, Swarbhanu becomes true. The head of Swarbhanu comes to be known as Rahu and the tail of Swarbhanu comes to be known as Ketu. We should understand a point here that from this, from that day to today, Swarbhanu has not forgotten what had happened at that Swamudra Manthan. The, the act that transpired between Sun, Moon and Swarbhanu still is very much in his memory. To this day, we have the eclipse happening all over the world in all the three lokas, wherein Swarbhanu as Rahu and Ketu does consume sun and moon for the snitch that they had made on him. Swarbhanu has not forgotten. In essence, Rahu and Ketu do not forget what we do in our lives. Every action of ours is recorded and then proceeded with further. This is something that we all would do well to remember that as karmic controlled planets, Rahu and Ketu do not forget any part of our karma, the good, the bad, or the ugly. Now let us come across what they represent, the houses that they're said to be exalted, the houses that they are said to be most comfortable in. The houses, the four houses of Gemini, Virgo, Sagittarius, and Pisces are also known to be the four Padas of the yoga, that is the Karma Yoga, the Bhakti Yoga, the Jnana Yoga, and the Raj Yoga. Pisces is said to be the Bhakti Yoga, and its corresponding partner, that is Virgo, is said to be the Karma Yoga. Jnana Yoga is Sagittarius, and 
Raj Yoga or the accumulation of all the three yogas that leads us to emancipation, that leads us to our own an intelligence where we can develop into a next scale is the Raj Yoga and it is governed by Gemini. So let us see how it unfolds for Rahu and Ketu because Rahu and Ketu are said to be most comfortable in these points. In fact, they consider it their Swarshetra or their own home and the points of exaltation as by many classical texts. We would start with Rahu in Gemini and Ketu in Sagittarius. Let us take up Ketu in Sagittarius. Gyan Yoga is the way to many for emancipation, the ability to conduct an inward journey, to move inwards to such an extent that we can realize the God within us, the wisdom that is the guru who shows us the path, the wisdom that we acquire, the elders that we see, the knowledge, the intellect that we experience is all a part of Sagittarius and so Ketu for the knowledge that it receives is very much the truth that it moves inwards for is very much comfortable in the sign of Sagittarius. Communication. As inward is Ketu, so outward is Rahu. Rahu is all about communication. Rahu in this day and age when we have an outburst and extra amount of information all over the place. This is the time when we need to come across, we need to see, we need to check, are we moving on a higher or a lower octave of Rahu? Rahu is communication, be it letters, be it internet, Rahu is electronics, and this is a virtual medium. Rahu, we should all remember, has no physical entity. It is just a point. So Rahu is most comfortable in this house of Gemini, of communication and media. And Rahu is also breath. We'll take this up as we wind up the session later. The other two sides that we see are Ketu in Pisces and Rahu calling one of the signs of Mercury again as its own sign and that is Virgo. Ketu is emancipation. Ketu is Moksha Karaka, the 12th house of the natural zodiac, where incidentally, Goddess Lakshmi in form of Venus also gets exalted, is all about letting go. It is all about giving. The 12th house represents ashrams, hospitals, charities. It's all about giving, 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 and letting go. And finally, these hospitals, these very ashrams, are also a form of emancipation. So Ketu here leads us to our final journey, that is towards our source. And so it is considered very good in these houses. As far as Rahu is concerned, sixth house of the natural zodiac is all about selfless service. It is all about getting a hand over the Shad Ripus or the six enemies, including Lob, Moh, Krodh, Mats, Matsarya. So it's all including of your anger, your greed, your, uh, your attachments, and also your ego. All these things need to be mastered in this house or they become your obstacles to move further on to the sixth house, from the sixth house to the seventh house. It is also candles. Rahu in its lowest octave is also a thief. So much that can be seen from this house as to how Rahu would be comfortable here in its lower or higher octave. That is for us to understand. In its lower octave, as a thief, we have seen from Samudra Manthan that Rahu is very comfortable. As far as its higher octave is concerned, Rahu is all about service because it is also the outlet of karma for us. So karma can be done only through working. It's the karma yoga 
that is operating here in this sign of Virgo. So it tells us that you have to move into an area of selfless service where you do not think about what you get in return. When you do not think about getting in return, your anger, your greed, and your ego goes out for a toss. The obstacles that you have been facing because of all these come to a standstill and slowly start vanishing. And Rahu would have done his job at a great higher octave. That gets us to another aspect through which Rahu can be realized at a higher octave. Virgo, let us not forget, is an Artha sign. So for us to do selfless service is a little difficult because Artha means an exchange. There has to be an exchange. What we do not realize is there is always an exchange. What we get is a loss of anger, loss of ego, loss of greed, which in itself is a purifying effect on us. So this is very important. Another thing that we had talked about for remedies was relating to Rahu in Gemini. Gemini is a sign of air. And air is something that we breathe in day in, day out. Have we ever considered that we, if we hold on to our air in our lungs, in our body, for more than the requisite time or for more than the time that we are able to, because there are many people who can hold on their uh, breath for two minutes, five minutes, underwater, over water, anywhere. But the normal people like us, for how long can we hold on to the breath? And what happens if we hold on to the breath? If we hold on to the breath for too long, we simply will become a bundle right there and then with no life left. Yes, so Rahu tells us a very subtle story that don't hold on. You cannot hold on. Rather, it emphasizes on the fact that we are not capable of holding on. Be, if we hold on to the breath, somewhere or the other, the body pushes it out after a some minute or so. Because the body realizes that it will not, cannot hold on that impure breath. Similarly, in our lives, Rahu tells us that there's nothing that we can hold on. We can only experience it, feel it, enjoy it, and then finally let it go. It is very important to let go of a situation, let go of a past which is not needed, which is acting as a poison in our body. So we have to let go of a past, not think too much about the future because you can only inhale once you have exhaled. Once you have let go of something, only then can you take on anything new. Rahu teaches us very many lessons, very subtle lessons that we need to realize and we need to take good care of. So when we are, when we are getting very uh, agitated or when we are feeling the pressure of Rahu on us, there are very many things that we can do. We can start on with our pranayam, understanding and keeping into mind that as we take in, so we let out. So hum. That is the mantra that comes with every inhalation and exhalation that we do. And then the selfless service that is asked to be done by, uh, to us by Rahu. If we do that, then we see that our obstacles move out of the way one by one. Finally, for the traditionalist, worshipping to Goddess Durga along with all of this will add on just the icing to the cake. I would like to ask you a very fundamental question here. Right at the beginning of any astrology class, there's one fundamental class that is taken and we are uh, taught that all the nine planets represent Rahu, um, sorry, all the nine planets represent Lord Vishnu. And Rahu is given the status of Vara Avtar and Ketu the Matsya Avtar. Vara Avtar is the Avtar of Lord Vishnu in form of a boar, wild boar, where he kills the brother of Hinakasha, that is Hinakashipu. And Matsya Avtar is the Avtar or the, it is the form, the incarnation of a fish wherein Ketu 
as K2, and that is the place where the pralaya or the delude, the great delude, happened. So, when all the planets are assigned a position in Lord Vishnu or as forms of Lord Vishnu, how malefic can they be? Have a thought, think about it, do live in your views so that we can create more videos like this. Till we meet again, have a great day and have a